Like I said, I'm gonna turn this down, if that's the case. Okay, cool. So, um, as I was saying, I've been teaching for six years, hosting for eight. A lot of you guys know that when I got started, um, I got started in the newspaper industry. My first business was, I need Bose earbuds too. Yeah, actually, you know, if you guys got any really cool earbuds, because these earpods suck, um, I'm a, <laughs> I'll learn. You know guys, I'm old, right? I'm like 37 years old, so this whole tech thing, as much as I can teach you guys Airbnb, you want to learn how to use an iPhone, that's probably not going to happen for me, guys. So, uh, yeah, so I've been teaching for six, hosting for eight, but that wasn't my first business. I was in the newspaper industry a long, long time ago. And that was right after I was homeless. So a lot of you know I was homeless in 2009. And before that, I was in music school. And before that, I was like a really poor kid in Wisconsin, abusive household. And we're not going to talk about my mom or my childhood. That's not the point of this video, but it all sets the stage, right? Um, I got into sales as my first way of making real money while in music school, which was what my dreams were. And then I went homeless because I overcommitted to a company and they kind of screwed me over. And then I started my first company like back against the wall of homelessness. And that's where you guys met me. It was 2014. After being homeless, I picked up a few properties. My employees were staying in them because they were selling newspaper subscriptions for me. And I was paying for their monthly housing. And that was how that worked. And then um, I ended up putting them on Airbnb because the guys moved out. And so I'm putting my place in a couple other places on Airbnb all the way until the Super Bowl happened. And that was the first time I was like, wow, this Airbnb thing can make money. And I stopped caring so much about this dying newspaper industry, right? That's me, stubborn and always hyper committed to whatever I do. Um, I uh, didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't want to be like, um, I didn't want to give up because I thought I was going to change the industry, is what I thought. Um, if there is a bad echo, you guys just let me know because I've got all my volumes off for everything I've got. So there shouldn't be an echo unless both devices are listening in on me at the same time. But yeah, so if, if it wasn't for the fact that I was a music kid, this last three months might have been nuts. Um, but you guys know me all the way to the point at which, uh, you know, from YouTube, right? Six years ago, I started YouTube. I built from 10 doors to what, 155, teaching you guys rental arbitrage which I had to do rental arbitrage even to live somewhere. If you guys know that when I said I got when homeless, I got evicted in 2009. It took, me, it took me two years to figure this out, but I was at a leasing office and I couldn't get a place to stay for me and a couple people that worked in my newspaper company. And they're like, hey, start a business. If you have a business, just give us your LLC information and we'll approve your business. For two years, I ran a company without filing an LLC. So I did, I filed it, got an EIN number, and then three days later, I was approved for an apartment. Three days into owning an LLC, I got my first apartment. It was nuts. Um, and that was the beginning, it was 2011, but it was a solution for me living somewhere. And that eviction stayed on my record probably till 2014 or 15, but by then I was so used to renting through apartments, I just kept doing it. Or through renting through an LLC, I just kept doing it. So 2014, I've got multiple apartments, yeehaw. 2017, Super Bowl comes, shows me how much money the industry can make. 2019, I care so much less about the newspaper industry and I've got all these properties. 2020, New Year's Eve of 2020, New Year's Day, I've got 103 properties. And then COVID hits and kills the newspaper business, almost kills our company in Philadelphia, and then Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston just carried the show, carried all the money and saved Philadelphia from going out of business back then. And that's when I caught COVID and realized that I was like super unhealthy, not taking care of my body. And that's when you guys saw the change from this like little skinny Sean to the tanned, jacked Sean, who got his hairline redone because I had a receding hairline and went had hair surgery, right? Money does buy happiness. Um, and you saw that transformation then, but that led to about two years ago where I think I was in the best headspace ever, ever in life, right? So owning a business, owning multiple, being able to mentor, all of these things were super helpful. All these things matter. Um, and that got me to a point where my relationships were better. You guys saw me fighting less in the comments with people because as you guys might expect, me growing up poor, me being a successful business owner and then being a YouTuber, I want you guys all to see that I'm successful and that I'm right. So I would argue with people in the comments all the time. And in a way, I still enjoy doing that. It's fun. Um, but I think I do a little bit less of that now. Um, but that led me to the point of two years ago, I ended up like in a space where I could probably build better, more healthy relationships on the back end of all my little traumas that made me my business owner. So. And um, at the end of that all, uh, I fell in love a little over a year ago. And that's kind of where this downward spiral starts is that relationship forced me to challenge everything that I thought I knew about myself. They say that relationships are a mirror. And, um, and so me, this guy who's altruistic, 
are allegedly generous, you know, with content and all this stuff, helping people out, feeling good about myself, I realized there's no level of good that I could do to make this other person accept me in the way that I needed to be accepted. And we just started to fall apart. I'm not going to tell you about my whole relationship, but it ended. Um, and it ended in a pretty brutal way. You know, it actually went toxic at the end, which means, you know, for any of you guys who've had bad relationships, we all go through it. Doesn't matter, money or not, consciousness or not, we all go through it. And um, so three months ago, I went through what I would consider to be kind of a dark place. I don't want to accuse it of being completely dark because you guys didn't see this wild, dark version of me. I just stopped really posting on YouTube nearly as much, stopped teaching. I got back into music, started writing music again. Those of you who are on my Instagram, you saw me be super emo almost every day, like uploading music content. And that was a big, important part of my life was the content that I uploaded um, that you guys all got to see if you saw my Instagram. But that was the part where I almost walked away too. Like when you build your life up because you were poor and you want people to see that you're rich and you want people to validate you for being rich and successful and then you think it's gonna get you somewhere where you're gonna be happy and it can, right? Well, I had different problems and I was happy to have different problems. But um, at that point, I got, you know, I guess I got to this situation where I kind of started to take it for granted. I started to realize that it was, it became a different version of the cage. And then the thing that was supposed to make me happy, the whole happy ever after, finally found a human that I can really, you know, love. First person I think I really ever truly love. The fact that it ended in a brutal, heartbreaking way. I was just sitting in my penthouse, like, not happy. I was like, I don't want to see these walls anymore. I don't want to be me anymore. And yeah, so I, you know, I've taught you guys through all of my hard lessons, and I think this is an important one to discuss, which is that you know you're going to become successful. You all are capable of it. And you need to check why. Why do I want to be successful? And you need to call yourself out for the things, the fantasies, the the entitlement, the predisposition, the pretension. You need to call yourself out for that stuff. And um, it took me a little while to get through it, but I realized, of course, like instead of just dropping my keys, you know, letting everything default, moving to a third world country and saying, screw life, which I was very well prepared to do, instead of doing that, um, I decided to, you know, get out and... Um, start like recreating myself again um, and let me make sure I've got my live chat with you guys just in case nothing happens nothing bad happens give me my live chat thank you okay we're good you guys let me know if there's any problems in the chat still it looks like chat's gotten a little quiet but hopefully that means you guys are listening which is nice thank you so much for paying attention and being involved in the listening of my storytelling so yeah Sean got his heart broke and Sean realized that it, money doesn't protect you from heartbreak and I went through a phase where I almost left it all. Um, got back to music, super grateful for that. And then I realized one of the things I like most is kind of like this stuff, the talking, the teaching. Um, I've still been doing my Zooms with my students every Saturday. That's been a huge part of my life. Um, and um, yeah, and so I want you guys to know that I'm not out per se. But I did buy a bus. I think I might go and shed the whole capitalism thing a little bit. I guess that's something you guys need to know. Is um, I'm very happy with the idea of just getting rid of this penthouse, selling most of my possessions, and moving into a bus that I'm going to convert to an Airbnb and just travel for six months. And I think what could be really cool for that is, that, you know, if um, any of you guys are in any less than Dallas sized cities, I'm probably going to be near you. Um, I'm going to be doing videos on the bus too, by the way. I've got a lot of summer release videos for you. Uh, you guys probably saw some of the pricing strategy stuff, some webinars I'm doing, but Summer Release did make a lot of changes and I found some really cool stuff. There's a new market research technique that I've learned using wish lists and it's nuts. I'm going to be teaching that soon. But then I'm also going to be doing Airbnb content and this bus conversion that I'm going to turn into an Airbnb and then I'm going to tour to your guys' cities. I'm going to be doing like little event bright pop-up events, um, Airbnb networking events because I will say that the most important thing that matters to me at this point now is expressing myself in a way that makes me happy. And I'm so happy to say that this is one of the main ways that makes me happy. If I'm not writing music, I hope to be teaching you guys uh, short-term rentals and helping you guys grow businesses. Um, a few of you may know my story with Rodney, my mentor that committed suicide. He was a business owner and he committed suicide due to some false allegation of child abuse, which is shitty. But I was in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program with him. And if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be nearly as good of a human as I am today, or a business owner. So, you know, kind of like just like him, his whole life was helping people out, mentoring, you know, children, but 
he uh, he learned the hard lesson, and I don't think I could ever mentor kids. That seems too dangerous. But young adults who want to start a business, let's go, right? So, um, uh, in the uh, I guess uh, in in my comment, like in my description of this video, I'll probably have my free Facebook group. If you guys aren't in there, please join that because I'm at, I chat with you guys all the time in there. Some of you know. Um, I'm also doing the, a webinar on the algorithm again. That's coming up soon for any of you guys who need it. If you guys remember Realgorithm from the winter, I'm doing a second one for the summer release. That was going to be pretty heavy duty, probably like four or five days. Um, and then stay tuned for some bus content. I am literally taking a jail bus. It was an inmate transport for LA County Jail. Bars on the windows and everything. I'm gutting that thing, turning it into an Airbnb, and the theme is going to be sick. I'm actually super excited about this, and I'm going to take it places. I'm going to take it the you know, just outlandish spots where I'm going to see if I can rent it for nuts amount of money. We're going to find out where it rents for the most money because I'm going to drive it around the country and do that. Um, that's one of the most exciting things. So yeah, I'm probably dropping the penthouse, probably dropping this place. I'm going to dematerialize, get nomadic, be more, I guess in a way, be more Airbnb, sleep in a lot of Airbnbs because I'm going to be traveling. Uh, I'll be doing some events um, in other countries too for you guys. So if you guys like the idea of like, all booking a big Airbnb house and then spending a three day weekend or four day weekend learning about Airbnb kind of like in a field trip format. Um, I've got a lot of really big students. Some of my students have like 500, almost almost 500 properties now. And so I'm just gonna tell my students like, hey, if you, wherever your guys' properties are, send me your list. We'll book some of them. We'll bring some people in for like a field trip retreat thing and, and let everybody stay. And we'll teach Airbnb at Airbnb locations. One of my students has some mansions in Costa Rica. That might be lo location number one. Another one of my students has some big stuff in Chicago. It could be location number two, maybe Canada. Maybe Italy would be nice, but um, yeah, you guys are gonna be seeing some different stuff. But I almost quit Airbnb because there is a point where things don't like make as much sense as they used to, where things don't add up anymore. If you guys ever worked for seven or eight hour a dollar an hour job and you got an eleven dollar an hour job, you might have got excited and then got to twenty bucks an hour, you were stoked. But I'll tell you, at one point, I charge a thousand dollars an hour for consulting, and there were real estate companies. They will pay me gladly a thousand an hour exhaustively for my my expertise, and there are times that I just don't want to take the call. For a thousand an hour, I don't want to do it, and uh, that's my big warning for you guys. You could get to a point where the money doesn't matter anymore. So make sure you're doing things for the reason that do, and uh, chatting you guys up here is probably the one of the reasons that I want to do this. Like I would rather talk to you guys in this weird, crazy format than take a thousand an hour from a hedge fund. I'm going to be dead honest. Um, so, let's see. If you guys might have some questions, I could like, just read them right out of the comment section. Since you guys have all been so patient with me, let's do that. Um, so, uh, make content of steps to make Airbnb units work remotely. So, uh, Diogo, um, let me actually tell you about work remote or Airbnb remote. If you do it yourself, it'll be cheaper. If you do it with a co-host, it'll cost more money. But there needs to be a local expert. And so I can do some videos about the mechanics of remote Airbnbs, like what needs to be operated and what can be done locally, what can be done remote. Like for example, RVAs, the people who communicate with the guests, they're not local, but they're US based because that's a preference. But I have a local manager who runs a local housekeeping company, housekeeping team that we built and that local maintenance and housekeeping and repair and stuff like that and having local leadership is gonna be important. So the only way to really pull that off outside of having a co-host, which is too expensive, I would have argued for you guys to be competitive and not pay that money. The next best thing for you guys is to go to that destination for eight weeks, run the thing locally for eight weeks, try to hire some local housekeepers, try to hire some local leadership, and then bounce away. And if you wanna to learn to run something remote, then practice somewhere three hours away. It's almost like a dress rehearsal. Let's say I see I live here in Dallas. so. I could do Waco, I could do Temple, I could do Fredericksburg, I could do Wichita Falls, I could do just outside of Weatherford, you know, I could do all sorts of great stuff. If you're, you're Chicago, go past Rockford. Maybe do Rockford as your work remote test. Um, if you're in New York, go to Baltimore. If you're in, you know, Atlanta, go as far down as Tallahassee. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you're in, you know, Las Vegas, go as far as Phoenix. Somewhere that you could still drive if you absolutely had to, but you're testing your remote capabilities. Don't just jump into the hardest thing in the world. Level up a little bit, guys. Remember, I started with 10 doors in Houston before I got into 155 in eight cities, right? I didn't try to do 155 doors in eight cities starting off, right? There are steps to your like learning. And take every door as a learning opportunity more than a money-making opportunity first, and that's gonna serve you big. 
Um, let's see. Hey, hello from Greece and from Georgia. Um, love that. How do we manage turvo turnover specifically with laundry? Um, uh, Rin, uh, good question because there's two ways. You can do laundry on-site, laundry off-site. Now, size of the property matters. So uh, let's say we've got, we've got this downtown Dallas property, right? There are five studios and we just do laundry on site. What will happen is our housekeeper will clean three doors, right? They might clean apartment A, B, and C. Well, this is calling that. They'll start the laundry in all three. Now, this is, a, like, this is a workflow hack. Before your housekeeper actually cleans, if you've got five apartments in the same building, have your housekeeper start the laundry at all five and then start cleaning all five units one at a time. And when she hears or he hears that dryer or washer buzz, then they go back through all five doors, run the laundry, again, push it through, keep cleaning. Next time the buzz, they stop for the laundry whenever, whenever the buzzer hits, but they can clean five apartments in four hours and they can run five washing machines over the four hours. If you do houses, you'll always have some offsite laundry. If you have really cheap B-class, C-class apartments, you might do offsite laundry by default. And what we do is we have what we call an overflow system. So we do as much laundry on site as we can, but anything we can't do, we throw into bags, hamper it, we tag it with its address, and then twice a week max, you don't want to do this every day, but twice a week max, you'll clean your overflow at a place that has commercial washer dryers. So you pay someone by the hour to run 20 loads of laundry, you're paying 13, 14 bucks an hour, and whatever the laundry cost is, boom. In Austin, we actually give it the spin zone. We let spin zone do the laundry because there's one like, like three blocks from one of our apartments, our housekeepers will grab all the laundry, drop it at spin zone, start cleaning. That stuff is done before the next day. They can pick up the laundry on the way to the apartment complex. So if you use a third party, something like spin zone, they do great commercial like for Airbnb house wash, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we have much better volume. Um, so I want you guys to know another feature too, since you guys are being cool and hanging out with me too. If you guys go onto Airbnb's, uh, what, like if you're a host, go to Airbnb, open up, uh, go to your calendar. For any one listing, go to your calendar, click on a date. Go to where the price can be changed in the top right. Then it's gonna have this compare to other listings feature. Now what's cool about this is it'll show you what the price of a booked listing is on average and what the price of an unbooked listing is on average. And you can do it for any dates. So you, I wanna look at my listing five weeks from now and see, who's booked, who's not booked. It gives you a map of who your competitors that are not booked are. It says all of your booked competitors five weeks from now are 150 to 200. All of your unbooked competitors five weeks from now are 180 to 260. And then here's the map view of all your competitors that are unbooked. And you can click on those bubbles, see their hero photos, see their prices, see their reviews. And you can find out if you're at the competition if the competition that's unbooked, if you're better or worse than, and you can make adjustments to your prices based on that. I'll be teaching more of that in the, in the future. Um, this is kind of similar to stuff that we're doing with wish lists. It's really cool ways to look at competitors. It's a big summer release thing. But what you'll notice is I want you guys to look at your five weeks from now calendar to see what your competitors' prices are. And then I want you to look at two weeks and then five days from now. You're gonna notice that the average price for booking goes down as you get closer and closer to today. But if you guys have ever done an absorption check, which I get, teach on like my market research videos, you no, might notice that five weeks from now, half of the properties were booked, say like 200 bucks. But three weeks from now, only 60% of properties are booked, like only 10% more, maybe 20% more properties are booked. But the price goes down like 20%. And I need you guys to understand, this is where you might need to know some math, right? If half the properties are booked at an average of 200% or $200, but then you add just 20% more bookings and the price drops 20%. That means those other 20% of bookings were somewhere near half off, right? They're, they're probably closer to $100 a night. Because if, if two properties can pull the average price of five properties down by 20%, right? Then that discount's actually think closer to 60. They're, they're actually 60% cheaper or something like that. So when you guys start to do your dynamic pricing models that I teach, you know how you drop your price over time, you can actually see like using the competitor thing for five weeks, four weeks, three weeks, just look at different dates. You can see that those prices on average drop and you can start to build your pricing model around your, your competition. But what's even cooler than just knowing that the competitor's prices are dropping over time, you can see what the leftovers look like. And if your competitors are trash, keep your prices up. If the only competition you have left to book against are trash, keep your prices up. But if you have good competition that's unbooked, you should probably drop your prices with the competitor feature that Airbnb supplies now. 
Um, midterm rentals for with an ADU as a short term. Uh, is this in Los midterm renters? Is this a little good? Um, you're in Los Angeles, Becca. I think so. This is a good question. Um, since Becca's in Los Angeles, you might be forced to do midterm rentals some of the months. Like some places give you 90 days of short-term rentals and you have to do midterms the rest. I will tell you guys, the only time you should ever do midterm rentals is when you have to. Okay? Because my short-term rentals that I can book by a night or by two nights or by three nights, they can also book for 60 or 90 nights. They're also midterm rentals, but they're primarily short-term. So first measure of strategies, do not get into the midterm rental market where other people also short-term rent because you're just you know cutting off one of your competitive levers. So now if you guys have an ADU as a short-term, um, the only thing I can think of is making sure that the short-term rental access for the ADU is like dispersed away enough from the midterm property that the midterm renter doesn't end up disenjoying your ADU enough that they have complaints or that they want to move out and affect your turnover. So if you could if you could make a double fence, right, where you've got an where you've got a fence for the yard for the midterm, but then you have like an extra two feet and a, like three feet and another fence that actually separates you from your neighbor's property, just that the inner fence that goes halfway down to the ADU could keep all the traffic noise going in and out, keep that sound barrier from the house itself. Which if you, because if you have crabby midterm runners, like that kind of bleed over would be a thing. That's the thing that we see sometimes with uh, short terms that mix with midterms, like in an ADU style where there's a shared yard. You will you might also want to have a shared yard, but make it part of the rules for the midterm and make the midterm rental people recognize that there is a shared yard. Or you have to partition off part of the yard so both people have some yard, like I said, separating it with a fence. But that could look rather funky. So if you can make a community... Um, community amenity areas that kind of look communal. Like if you redid your, your backyard to have a mix of concrete and pebble and grass and like a fire pit and like a, like a pergola with some swing sets and stuff, something that looks a little bit more playful and fun and enjoyable instead of it just being plain yard takes the midterm renter out of the get off my lawn mentality and makes it more like, oh, we're staying at an experience and I've got some neighbors who share these with me. That's going to be good too. Um, I like if you're going to have a midterm rental and an ADU short term, that midterm, you should also run the Airbnb rooms split strategy because you're already going to have a little crossover and stuff like that with the with the shared amenities in the backyard. Consider doing Airbnb rooms. Um, all pink Airbnb. Um, if you're the one in Dallas, that's a beautiful property, by the way. Um, if your all pink property isn't doing good, I want you to consider using PeerSpace and Gigster. Um, and if you already are doing that, I want you to really consider your pricing model. You might need to meet the market in a way that you've never had to meet the market before. We're in a very volatile time here in this world that we live in right now in short-term rentals. So a lot of people who've made a lot of money at $600 a night to $900 a night, for the first time ever, they have to go down to 400 or 300 They won't do it because they've never had to before. Some people won't meet the market on principle. So I want you, Rin, to go take a look at your, your pricing, your competition. I want you to go look at local trends because you, you either have what well, you have an SEO problem or you have a price problem. That's it. The market has been so volatile that it could just be price and you might need to meet temporarily meet the market on a new price. And that's it. Um, uh, Constantine, the wish list um, trick, I'm going to I'm going to show July 10th. In my re algorithm two, I'm gonna show an example of that. And then I'm gonna do a deep dive from I'm gonna do a market research webinar in about three or four weeks after Shambhala in Canada. Because you guys know I love my music festivals. Shambhala's July twenty first to uh, July twenty fifth. So July tenth, I'm doing a an algorithm webinar and I will show the wish list trick, but all the ways that I'm using it, like the really crazy stuff, the deep dive on all the ways you can do market research with it, which is gonna be probably thirty minutes of its own time will happen after July 25th in my next market research webinar. Um, I am teaching to my students in Cracking Superost first. They get first access to everything, um, but that would be the only other place to find it. So if you're in Cracking Superost, just ask me on Saturday. Um, Eric might debate quitting Airbnb, can't get short-term rental permits in cities that have properties since they cap them. Um, Eric, now the question is, is how's their enforcement? Since you're already doing short-term rentals, 
I would wonder what is their enforcement? What's going to look like if they catch you? How are they going to find you? Are they capable of finding you? Do they put a lien on your property? They just send you a bill. Um, can you then also do peer space and Gigster and then do midterm rentals with peer space and Gigster peppered in? Can you do midterm rentals, peer space, Gigster, and then Airbnb rooms now and mix it into one big complex marketing strategy that's technically not disallowed? Um, try to be creative and adaptive, I guess is my point for that. Um, Viola asked about the free guest fee at, uh, for Airbnb. A lot of you guys can charge one price or you can charge a price and then have a fee per guest. I would argue for all of you, most of you, do not use the per guest fee because it's much easier to get to what I would call price perfection in your pricing strategy if you don't charge per guest. Because four months from now, a house that's big should be priced big. Just price it big four months from now. And a big group will pay big money. But if you had a per guest fee, and let's say somebody could book at half the price if there's just three of them, four months from now, a small group might pay half the price where you would have otherwise got a big group that paid big. You do not want to market to less people for our future. So the per guest fee is actually inefficient in the way that it could cost you big money sometimes. Mark, I will come back to Puerto Vallarta. Absolutely. Um, send me a DM on my Instagram. Um, like I said, I'll be doing these retreats. So if you've got a big enough house where we can pull a bunch of hosts and teach them Airbnb at your place, I will book your property and we'll bring some hosts. But please send me a DM on Instagram. It's going to be Airbnb automated. Who would have thought, right? Um, and thank you for that invite. Um, let's see. Sean, do you still charge cleaning fees? Um, Diogo, I actually have split mine. As an educator, part of my properties have a cleaning fee and part of my properties don't in order for me to tell you guys whether or not you should have them. And I'll tell you, for apartments, no cleaning fee is still great for apartments. For houses, it's not worth it for houses. Just maybe drop your cleaning fee in half and then move half of that to a management fee for houses. But no cleaning fee for apartments is great. Thank you, Ella. I'm trying to be a good teacher. Um, any of you guys with, uh, is, is your name Serge? S and then Erge? Erge? That's a, a cool name. Um, if you have, if you want to send me a, a, an Instagram message too regarding a property that, you know, we can come hang out at, I'm down. Since I'm going to be mobile, I'm going to be in your guys' cities for once, which is going to be super, super cool. Um, let's see. Yes, Eric, look at Peer Space, Gigster. There's a couple alternatives. Airbnb Rooms is a big thing right now because... Airbnb wants to push into a market that Burbo and Marriott Homes and Villas can't get to. That's why they're doing it. Um, so uh, Diego asked about marketing strategies to keep previous guests in the loop. Um, you know what? I've got a couple, but I'll tell you that any more than beyond what I know, I'd be just stealing from Mark from Boostly. I'm going to be dead serious. Get get on StayFi. StayFi allows you to grab everybody's internet, like emails, and then send them a promotion. Send them something as a gift. Like a really nice, nothing, no catch. But send them an email with, hey, here's a free something. Something local. So when they register their email locally, you send them a coupon for a nice local restaurant. And, um, and just say, please enter your phone number and we'll send you a QR code, your name, and whatever. And then they can redeem that and you can get more information. With your customers, you need to get their email first and then try to get their phone number and then try to get them to respond to things in time, this takes time to groom a relationship. You're gonna to wanna to have value that you deliver more than anything else. You wanna be able to say, guy, here's some free stuff, stuff for here. Hey, here's an article. Um, if you guys want discounts on flights, we just found this company that does discounts on flights. But give them stuff without asking anything in return. And then what you do is you send an email one day going, hey guys, um, for any of you thinking of traveling to our area for any of these upcoming holidays, we have blocked these days off as and to reserve them for our returning customers which is you if you would like these days they are blocked out um to in, in reservation for you so call us if you'd like any of these dates and so what you've done is you block your most popular dates to have them booked as a direct booking because they're going to get booked on airbnb anyway so take a swing of the bat and try to get them booked direct and that's a that's a mark from boostly trick i'm going to tell you that one is a mark from boostly trick but as far as a content creator and a brand strategist, I'll tell you the very first three or four contacts you have with anybody who gives you their email, they have to be thankful that they gave you their email. So just be very careful how you interact with people who do give you that information. 
Um, business analyst guru asks, do I have a training program for people looking to get into the short-term rental business? Uh, well, yes, I actually absolutely do. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give you guys a link to my main website. I don't have all my stuff memorized, but I do have a course. I would argue that it's the best course in the whole wide world for short-term rentals. Um, so much so that I actually have to, I have to send somebody a cease and desist for copyright infringement. I found somebody on my podcast who uh, stole my script. My door script, I, he's talking about it on a podcast. And, and as a content creator uh, slash educator, I just found out that my course is actually copywritten upon creation since I'm a teacher. Um, and so it's kind of fun. So I've got to tell the guy to stop using my pitch. Um, uh, Nivesh said that Airbnb has lost so much following uh, due to uh, getting bookings from new Airbnb guests. Oh, no. Okay. He says, yeah, Airbnb has lost a lot of its old following. This is true. Um, because a lot of hosts no longer host like they used to, Airbnb host problems. So now a lot of Airbnb's newest customers are like this new wave of, I also go to hotels. And there's, there's implications to that. You need to treat people with the level of expectation that a hotel guest, like they are going to behave like they are in a hotel. They're not going to be the old, super nice, fresh Airbnb people. Not yet. Airbnb is going to push to get, bring those people back with Airbnb rooms. But for now, you know, we do have a hotel crowd. Sheila asks, well, we're just into Airbnb two years ago. Well, we're always fully booked uh, now so slow. Um, yes, you can sign up for Verbo. Um, and I actually have a Verbo uh, quick link for you guys. Let me send you that too. If you guys want to um, sign up for Verbo, just go to this link here and there'll be a link to sign up for Verbo. I'll be doing a Verbo education, like a webinar, uh, probably next month in August on how to use Verbo, like pro tips. Now... You might be having a price problem on Airbnb or a, a, a placement problem on Airbnb. Um, if, uh, if you end up on one of my future webinars and you share your property, I'll be able to like show you around. If you're ever in Cracking Superos, my mentorship, this is stuff we do every Saturday and I'd actually go through all of your data and tell you what's wrong. Um, I think it's probably just a very slight price problem. If you've only been in the industry two years, you've seen the best two years for your area probably and now things are pulling back. You will have to drop your prices more than you ever expected compared to the last two years. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I appreciate you calling me out. I am pretty old. I put the old in OG. Um, let's see. Uh, what are your thoughts on Airbnb ban in Dallas? Um, Arthur, uh, I, I'll mark my words. It's not going to be nearly as bad as what people think. I just think they don't have the legs for it. Think of it this way. If Airbnb gets banned in all residential zones, everything but hotel, they won't be able to enforce that. They don't have the staff. So now they've got to vote what level of like zoning to cut off, right? And they need to keep it manageable. There is a group of old, angry, waspy people, white folk that go to bingo but have money that are angry about Airbnb. That's a predominant issue in Dallas. There are residentially zoned neighborhoods that are so like basic that they could just like take the first two residential zones and ban them there and protect all the old folk that are clutching their pearls going, oh, stay off my lawn. And I think that's, that's most likely what's gonna happen. It might be a little bit more banned, but it's gonna be manageable. But if they go too far and try to cover too many neighborhoods, they're gonna not be able to, they're not gonna be able to enforce it and they're gonna wipe out. And the more that they ban it, the more they're gonna get pushback. And in Austin, a guy like one at the like the, like the state level Supreme Court that it's unconstitutional to tell a homeowner what they can do with their property, what they can't do with their property. So Texas is gonna you know, say my constitutional rights is what's gonna happen if they push it too far. Um, tip top vacation, absolutely instant book is almost always a lever. Unless you're somewhere like Park Cities, Utah, Winter Park, Colorado, places where almost nobody has instant book on, then you don't need to use it because you're not at a disadvantage. It's best practice to always keep up with your competition, never be at a disadvantage. So if no one uses a feature and you don't need to use that feature to beat them, then don't use it. But if everybody uses a feature and you're not using that feature, you could get, you know, you could end up behind. Um, when do you reduce price to get bookings for the same day? We reduce them twice. We reduce them immediately after checkout. So let's say checkout's 11 a.m. We reduce our prices at 11.15 because anybody who wants to extend could request to extend, and if we already dropped our prices, they get a cheaper price. So if your checkout's at 11, start doing your pricing, start like just after 11, and then do it again at 5 p.m. 
right? Do 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. Drop them again, 5, 6, or 7 p.m. Because you're, out, you're running out of time. For apartments, do that for apartments. Houses, raise your prices. Because the, the most likely thing that's gonna happen is somebody who has a really true need, a true, true need and no supply. Airbnb might call you and go, hey, um, a host just canceled. We need a place, can we use yours? So I would raise your prices at like 3 p.m. Jack your prices up just in case Airbnb calls you. That's a hack. Um, Zay, um, seems, seems like you missed, um, it seems like you missed, uh, hold on, you might have not. Um, I was in a relationship and it was with a female. Thanks for asking. Um, and I will tell you in relationships, they can work out with one person being toxic, like a safe partner can kind of keep other people's toxic kind of like at bay. But there, there can come a point where both parties become toxic and everything spirals out of control. Um, I did good for a little while, but then, you know, sharp edges cut sharp and then, you know, we, have, we both started to not be good for each other. But yeah, I was in a relationship with a girlfriend. Um, so how helpful is Airbnb, Air DNA top 28 list? Um, I don't think Air DNA's top 28 list is necessarily going to, well, actually, hold on. It might be helpful for very short periods of time. And it's also, the date is also too late. That's another thing. I remember one time. I told one of my students four or five years ago, go to uh, Birmingham, Alabama. His name was Mike Stone, I think. No, it was Mike Arizona. It was, it was an attorney. I think it was Mike Stone. Um, and I said, go to, go to, um, go to um, Birmingham, Alabama. And he set up, he was instantly one of the biggest hosts, 18 doors, no one else could touch him. And then... A year and a half or two years later, like up to two years later, then AirDNA says, this is one of the best places to be an Airbnb host right now. So what happens is AirDNA uses back data and says, in review, these are doing good in review. Problem is, is now that that dinner bell has rang, how many other hosts are looking at the same data as you? You're now going to push into a market that everybody else knows about. So I do think AirDNA is a little late if you want like an actual good safe opportunity. So you need to be thinking about the mechanics of what makes a market good before it gets like good and that or before uh, before the data says it's good. Um, that's why I like the Midwest so much. Um, uh, how do you popularize short term rentals in low income country? Golan, that's an interesting question. Now, the short term rentals may not be tourist, may not be recreational. And that's another thing I want you to consider is try to Try to identify every type of customer and every imaginable use case that somebody could stay at a property for just one night or one day or one week, maybe even just a few hours, like peer space, peer space gigster events and stuff. And you might find that the type of customer you hoped to capture is not the one that exists. So there could be like government travel, there could be other types of business travel, education-based, medical, there could be recreation and tourism, could be construction workers. You could have people trying to shoot videos, indie films, wedding venues, um, business mixers. There could be all sorts of reasons why people will book a property and may not be the one you're thinking because Airbnb's made this popular, but that's the thing is you could have a bias because of how you, how you found short-term rentals. You might have a bias in what customer you're looking for. So just be aware of that. Um, a South American Airbnb managers, yeah. Um, I've got a student, his name's Michael Morrison. He's got a portfolio in uh, Medellin, Colombia. He gets it. So um, look up Michael Morrison. Um, uh, he's in my Cracking Super Host program. Find him. He's great. Um, Sheila says, my husband's too kind. We charge per person. We have two guests check in, yet they occupy three beds. Um, just send the resolution. Just send the resolution as if you're not doing anything wrong, right? So Sheila, what you'll do is say, hey, thank you so much for saying. Um, you have the video documentation. Like, hey, you didn't prepay for your third person. I'm just adding it to your reservation as, as a resolution. Just please pay that whenever you can. Because when your contract says something and a guest does something, they've agreed to it. Just act as if the guest has agreed to pay for the third person because your contract says they should. They should have read the contract. So since they did bring an extra person, you don't even you don't even need to fret or talk about it. Just send the resolution. And here's the thing: some people go, "Oh, teehee, my bad, sure, click pay," 
And some people will go, I'm not going to pay that. At least that's still better than not trying. And you're like, if somebody says, oh, I'm not going to pay that, um, you'll say, you know, okay, um, it was so great having you. Please come back. <laughs> Something like that. You know, whatever. What, you want to turn that into a, hey, we did you a favor, you can do that too. But just treat it as if the guest already agreed. Just start a resolution as expecting them to pay. And don't say anything too nervous. Just be like, hey, uh, you didn't prepay for your third guest, so I'm putting it up as a resolution. Just pay this whenever you can. Thank you. Keep it short and sweet. Um, doo -doo -doo. What do you plan on cash flow per unit for a 200 pound one bed, 400 pound two bed? Is this normal cross B properties? Um, we try to make a net operating margin of $800 US per bedroom in the States. 800 US per bedroom. Two bedrooms don't always do a full 1600 US because the, the change in production um, on Airbnb, like in, in revenue, can is ne not necessarily so much more, but the moment you jump to a three bedroom or a four bedroom, your revenue can start to just scream. So studios are they're better than one bedrooms because they can sleep the same number of people, but they cost less to furnish and they photograph better. So studios are great. Then one bedrooms make a little less money than a, a than a studio. Two bedrooms make a little more money than a studio compared to what they should. And then three bedrooms, the revenue just clips up. And then four bedrooms, the revenue keeps clipping up. So studios or three bedroom plus is what I'd recommend for you. But that's it. Um, Sasuke, I can't actually help you with that. I'm not in the real estate world. Can you believe it, guys? I can teach you anything you want to know about Airbnb, but where to find home sellers? I can't find that for you. Um, but my best friend, Sean Ray, Sean Ray Realty here in Texas could. Um, uh, Ren, if you were underperforming like that, um, post your properties in the hosts of Airbnb Automated, my free Facebook group, the hosts of Airbnb Automated, post and go, hey guys, what's wrong with my property? We're not making any money. And let's see, let's see what's up. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Um, how much have I downsized? Um, we just shut down Philadelphia because of crime. That was really rough. I'm sad to say that. So we shut down about 30 properties in Philly because of crime. Um, this group kept breaking in, stealing our TVs. They actually murdered some people, um, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, we've been super cash heavy for a long time. So I think maybe the thing is, is you know, other people, like I told you guys too, that I guess the, you know, the film professor had, let me kind of give you context to his question. Um, the market's been beating a lot of people up. And I think the people who are going cash negative are people who don't have co-hosts. I mean, people who do have co-hosts, right? People who have co-hosts, they uh, they have to give away the first 25% of their money to someone else. And that can be really, really tough. So, um, but we did shut down Philly. Um, we shut down one of our buildings in Houston. It was, uh, it just was underperforming. So that's probably the, the, the sad sad in, in Texas, but Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, great. Always great, so thank God. We, maybe we're lucky, you know, maybe we're lucky that we're in markets that we're in urban Texas markets. For the most part, that's really good. Um, Yaren, you know, um, I don't quit. I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to drink, quit drinking coffee. I still drink coffee. I'm still here on this, uh, on this uh, webinar thing, on this live stream. I can't seem to quit that either. Um, I don't think I can quit. It's actually something I, I have a hard time doing, but I almost did. I literally almost just quit everything because I felt so just dif like disgusted by how much I put all my identity into capitalism and then got my heart broken, you know. Um, but I found on the back end of that that the re like one of the main reasons why I'm here is I love coaching. I love teaching. It really does service my ADHD brain. It really helps me, you know, feel good about myself. So this is stuff I love. So let's see if there's any other useful questions and we'll wrap this up. Um, you guys had some good questions. This was kind of fun. This was a fun, like, back-end um, Q&A session, which is fun. So, guys, in four days, I will be doing a re-algorithm, too, which we're going to go over the summer release, everything that's happened in the summer release and how it affects your replacement in the algorithm and the changes you need to make. It's one. Um, two, I've got my free Facebook group. Uh, you guys, I have a free course. You guys might not know that I have a free course. I made it a while ago, but you, if you join the Facebook group, you get the course for free. Really helpful for a lot of you guys. Um, and then, yeah, I bought a bus. It's going to be coming to Airbnb. It's going to be sick. And I'm going to drive it around city to city and talk to you guys in person. I'll be doing like a lot of pop-up events and I'll be doing some public speaking and 
traveling the world-ish, the Western world in my bus. That is an Airbnb. And then at times I'm just going to book a hotel room and put it on Airbnb in some destination and see if it makes a lot of money is what I'm going to try to do. And we'll find out where buses that are Airbnbs make money. It's going to be really, really cool. And of course, it will be at Burning Man. Um, those of you guys who know I'll be at Burning Man, my camp is called Exclamation Mark. And I'm running the kitchen. I'm the lead in the kitchen because I love to cook. So if you guys want to eat, come find me at 2 and I at Burning Man. And my bus will be there. So um, I'll do more live streams. I'll figure out what's wrong with my live stream thing that I was doing earlier. And I'll fix it, be, hopefully, before next time. Otherwise, I will literally just pop up the laptop. And we can do it just like this. Um, and Steve asks about apartments requiring fobs um, to enter be complex before getting into the front door. Um, every building is a little different um, when it comes to entry. With B-class apartments, we can get them to let us change their locks and actually put a keyless entry. So we negotiate to get keyless entry whenever possible. If a fob is required, we try to find out what level of access into the building can a guest get between, like with keypads and otherwise before they need to have to have to have a key, right? And then we set up locks boxes wherever is most suitable for them outside of the rain as as interior as possible for them. In some buildings, we actually get these lockers that are multiple like drawers of keys and we get the building to let's drill that into the garage or like into the like a hallway outside or something like that. And then we've got this key locker that's got eight or 10 keys and that's really good for our apartment deals. We love those a lot. Worst case scenario, you hang the key on the door and. You know, if you're in a third world country and, and labor is cheap, then you can actually pay somebody a very small amount of money by the hour to help people in and out. Um, and the, the, we see this in Mexico all the time, third world countries all the time, because it's cheaper to have the staff for a couple bucks an hour than it is to pay $100 for technology, right? And you get better customer service that way. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Um, APS, do you worry about permitting with the bus thing, hotel occupancy stuff? Well, the bus might be transient. So when the bus hits a place and I rent it out, they may not be able to find it in time for me to rent it out and move on. If it becomes a sticking point where I, I keep a bus in, a, in an area for a period of time, I will be looking at permits and requirements, what I need to do to be able to legally do it. But if I'm just passing through Albuquerque, Mexico, and there's like a... New Mexico and there's a Taylor Swift concert in Albuquerque. I will park that I will park that bus in front of their convention center and just keep the engine keys and go Taylor Swift King Suite on the sidewalk in front walk to the concert, right? Um, outside front door of concert. I'll charge a thousand bucks a night or some junk for a Taylor Swift concert where I park the bus on the street on the block. I'll do that for four nights. I don't care. We'll see. Because we're gonna test it. I'm I'm here to educate and do some risky stuff. And I could literally do that here in Dallas in front of the American Airlines Center. I found a spot I could park my bus, and if Taylor Swift came back, I could have the bus keys down there, charge a grand a night. And somebody could literally walk out of American Airlines Center, walk past this restaurant, and into the bus and sleep. Like, it would be the sickest. So, we're going to see how this could work. Um, thank you, Jasmine. Um, all right, guys. Um, hold on, we got maybe one last one. What price suggestion tool was okay? But you can still get the same data by doing the competitor thing. The logic is still there. The engine is still there. Um, the price suggestions, um, actually, do, when you go click on your listing and then pricing, your pricing and availability, and you go click at your base price section, they give you a price suggestion right there. They just don't give it to you day by day. You have to, when you do the day by day stuff, go to the calendar and look at to compare to other listings. And it still gives you a lot of the logic there. Um, and then, Trying to get renting house list on F on Facebook, but they never reply. Can you tell me a site or something where I can get people who reply except middlemen between the ten? Um, Suzuki was asking, I'm looking for a list of properties that I can rent and then do Airbnb. Who here would love a list like that, right? I want a list of all the houses in Dallas that I can rent today and do Airbnb tomorrow. I will tell you, if you look for that list, you will have worse heartbreak than I suffered three months ago. The reason why is these lists are not updated, they're not real half the time. Um, they're made by leasing agents or people who are looking to not even be a real estate agent. They don't even have their real estate agent's license. They're trying to broker things to you. The best way for any of you to do arbitrage, which is to rent a property, house or apartment, and then go do this Airbnb thing, is you need to learn a script. You need to learn how to talk to a landlord. You need to call any house on the planet. 
one that just has a for rent sign in the yard, call them up and ask to meet them in person, and then convince them in person to say yes. The reason why is if you get attuned to picking up the properties that are best for you based on the neighborhood, based on the comps, based on the market research, and you can call any house that fits your specs and convince that landlord, you'll then be profitable. But if you have a small list of properties that you can Airbnb, you're gonna pick one even though if you did market research in that neighborhood with that property type, the data might show you that that property is not gonna make money. And you're picking from a list of what might be not profitable properties and then you're gonna be suffering. Instead, learn to do market research, find the stuff that makes money, and then be confident enough to call any house in that neighborhood and go, hey, can I meet you in person? I would like to take a walk through your property and tell you about our business. I'll bring you a coffee, what do you say? And then pitch that landlord. That is how you make money in the space. Do not rely on anybody's list. It will hurt you in multiple ways. If you guys are looking for a script, um, let's. Uh, if you guys go to Google right now, just open a Google tab and go, how to pitch landlords Airbnb. Let's see what pops up. How to pitch landlords Airbnb. Um, we're going to have, I've got multiple of my videos pop up, right? There's another guy named Greg and then there's stuff for by me. And actually, let me see if there's a play, me, how to pitch landlords Airbnb playlist. Yeah, um, I have, there it is. I don't know if I can say, add this to chat, but um, if you go, if you like actually Google search how to pitch landlords Airbnb or how to pitch landlords rental arbitrage, one of my playlists pops up. And I've got a free playlist on learning to pitch landlords rental arbitrage. So go do that. Um, Can you make live streams so you can have call-ins? Um, one day, I will do that one day. Let me learn how to do this. Um, somebody thinks I'm crazy for thinking that I can charge $1,000 a night to park a bus in front of a Taylor Swift concert. Do you guys know how much Taylor Swift tickets are? People are paying $15,000 for the Taylor Swift concert ticket. Okay, this is crazier than the Super Bowl. This is nuts. So yes, I am nuts. I'm tripping because people are paying $15,000 per ticket for Taylor Swift. I can make a thousand dollars a night with my bus. Um, and midterm rentals, we should talk about the host of Airbnb automated group. I did say before, do not do midterm rentals in a market that also does short term. You should do short term rentals and then also make your place midterm rental friendly. Um, I have a kitchen video for you to watch. Just type in Sean Rocky Jeech kitchen, Airbnb video, YouTube, something like that. I've got this pro kitchen video that'll show you a lot of like mentally, what's the difference between a short term rental and longer stays for bigger or smaller properties. That kitchen video helps really get you in that space. Um, Eric, thank you. Maybe I'll do StreamYard instead of OBS because OBS has really been hurting my feelings lately. I need a better streaming software. With that said, my friends, my lovely people, um, thank you so much for hanging out with me on this um, kind of hard to start live stream. I, I really do um, love that you guys all give me the support and uh, time to do this because this is maybe my favorite thing to do aside from play piano. So yeah, if you guys want to hear my music, go to my Instagram. It's risk underscore and underscore reward, risk and reward. I post my piano vocal stuff there sometimes so you can hear me play music there. I will have my music studio on my bus. I'll be writing music and teaching Airbnb as I travel the world. It's going to be super fun. So um, yeah, let's um, let's find a way to like cut this live stream because my, my computer's frozen um, and uh, we'll get... Um,